and welcome to Epiphytic Cacti. Today I wanted to talk about a species, Weberocerus frondingerum. I lovingly nicknamed this species Frogger to avoid trying to say the name. I obtained a cutting of this plant on September 9th, 2018. I was shopping for Epiphyllum hybrids and found a source with a few hybrids I thought were interesting. The source also had a cutting of frondingerum for sale. I googled it and there was just something about it. I didn't know if it was a desert cactus or what because I didn't really do any research at the time. I literally knew nothing about it. When I got the cutting in the mail, I remember thinking how interesting and strange it was. It was very thick, heavy, and sturdy. I decided it needed to grow like the epiphyllum hybrids or it wouldn't be growing at all. So I stuck it in my standard epiphytic cacti mix and put it near an east window. I barely paid attention to it through the winter, and suddenly I noticed something different. Some type of new furry growth thing was on top of it. So I started paying attention to it and giving it a bit of water and the furry thing kept getting bigger. In that moment, I, I sort of fell in love with it. Um, it. There was just something so odd about it. Like the, you just everything about it was so interesting. I, it was like, this weird little furry thing. It's like a furry little dude and how it was growing. It, it was just, I just fell in love with it. So not too long after that, I finally purchased the Epiphyllum Society of America registry. As I was leafing through the species section, I found my frogger cactus. Turns out it's also an epiphytic cacti belonging to the tribe Hylocere, which are generally found in the tropical forests of Central America. It is endemic to Costa Rica. During some further research about this species, I also came across the fact that it is critically endangered. A lot of our epiphytic cacti species populations are declining or endangered. A great resource for finding information on a species is the website www.iucnredlist.org. On the about page of their website, it notes they were established in 1964. They are the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List of Threatened Species. They have evolved to become the world's most comprehensive information source on the global extinction risk status of animal, fungus, and plant species. Here's some general information on how to actually use the IUCN's website. You can basically search, type in the genus or even part of the plant name that you're trying to find. It'll list out pretty much every species that it has information on. And then you can actually click into it and look up what's going on with it. And you can see here that this is critically endangered. You can find more information like the number of mature species projected in the wild is 49. You can find the geographic range. So like I said, this is endemic to Costa Rica and it really only grows in a, two locations. The range description is really interesting because it says this species endem is endemic to Costa Rica, distributed in, in the botanically rich Pacific coastal range just south of San Jose, along the border between San Jose and Pantarinas provinces. It grows at an elevation of 1300 meters. Now you can find more information like its habitat. It basically says the habitat is a forest. Uh, this species grows on limestone rocks and in wet montane forests. Uh, as you go down, you can actually look at the threats. Basically tells you what all of the threats are to its natural habitat. The, uh, it tells you what the most, what the largest threat is. In this case, it's small scale ranching. Um, but it really lists them out like agriculture and aquaculture, livestock farming and ranching, smallholder grazing, ranching or farming, stresses, ecosystem stresses and ecosystem degradation. According to this site, the species isn't growing anywhere that is protected. It does seem that there is some sort of education in place for it because it says that it is included in international legislation and is subject to international management and trade controls. That's really how I like to use the IUCN website. So when I realized that I had irresponsibly purchased an endangered species and essentially played Russian roulette with its life, I got a little more serious about knowing what I was getting myself into, as well as species in general and caring for them properly. Luckily, my intuition seemed to be exactly what this plant actually needed to grow. I treated it exactly like I do my epiphyllum, only I give it less water because the branches are so much thicker. So my thought there was is that it would be more water retentive and thus need less watering. Basically, when the substrate looks dry, I wait for a few more days up to a week before watering. 
I would water them less in the winter when they are not actively growing, when they are moved outdoors in the spring, when the nighttime temperatures are above 50, they are watered naturally from the rain. My average outdoor growing temperatures are between 60 degrees and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average rainfall per month is 2.5 inches to 4.3 inches. There are times where I will have four days straight of just solid rain. Um, and when it rains here, it's like if you've never been in a Midwest kind of rain, it's, it like rains, like huge raindrops that could literally knock you out. It like if you're, you know, if you experience rain in a lot of times, like, you know, on like the West Coast of the United States, like Washington or California, like you experience what, what I call mist. Um, we get rain here, like flash flood warning, like three feet of rain in the road <laughs> kind of experience. So Midwest rain is definitely rain. I've noticed that through the winter when I bring them indoors, they do well in a south window that has outdoor tree cover for some shade. It seems to do most of its growing in the spring. It has not bloomed in my care as of yet. It also seems to enjoy more sun than a standard epiphyllum hybrid. While all that fur looks really cute, um, there are actually pretty aggressive spines underneath all those fun tufts of hair. I have not noticed any cultural issues. If memory serves, it rooted very easily with no interference from me. I didn't water it or mist it, I don't believe that it rooted like really quickly. I think it just was, you know, like I said, I got it, I, I put it in my mix, I put it in East Window and I essentially forgot about it. And this was indoors until I noticed that it was basically putting on a new branch. And then I, I did get a second cutting from a different source. I pretty much had an identical experience with rooting and growth. Thank you for watching and happy cacti growing.